Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, uh, the fourth philosopher, fourth, let's see, we did uh, Bacon, Newton, Locke, Hume, four, yes, the fourth philosopher in the British Philosopher series, uh, David Hume. Now, Hume um, is perhaps, as some people claim, he's the most influential English language philosopher. I don't know how you would prove something like that, so I think it's just better to say he's a really, really influential and important thinker. And he's sort of the uh, ne plus ultra of the empiricist movement. It's hard to figure out how you would be more empirical than Hume was trying to be. He sort of let, sets a bunch of limits and explores a bunch of places that um, other people have looked at and researched and developed. But Hume's, Hume was just sort of took everything to its logical conclusion. And so it really was hard to you know move on from there. So he kind of laid out a bunch of ground. In fact, one of the things I want to suggest is the best way, or perhaps not best, one good way to think about Hume is as an explorer. I mean, he really sets out to try and clarify all kinds of very difficult and subtle issues. How successful he is, meh, you know, your mileage may vary. But the fact that he was opening up these new territories, making new arguments, creating all kinds of insights while doing this, um, not necessarily coming to a lot of necessarily, prof you know, s s defensible conclusions, but just raising a lot of issues that people had either avoided or tried to overlook or glossed um, is, is I think, the power of Hume. And so you have someone like Kant who disagreed with him on all kinds of issues. When he read Hume, Hume he said Hume uh, sort of woke him up, raised him from his slumbers. And so many thinkers who would argue against Hume still credit him with saying, oh, yeah, Hume is the guy that woke me up, that made me go, oh, that's true. I don't like where Hume went with that, but boy, you've got to answer that question as we'll see. Um, this comes up all the time. So one way to think of Hume, he's not one of these uh, philosophers who left a completely coherent, easy to present uh, system that you can then apply and, and, and demonstrate everything from. But he was hugely influential in part just because he kept opening up fallow a uh, new land that people then, you know, planted and explored and created from. So that's really kind of the magic of Hume and why I think you can think of him as such a, a significant and influential thinker. So he's born 1711, died 1776. So he's right there in the core of the Enlightenment. And he's a University of Edinburgh product, sort of. So it, it's hard for us to sort of get a context of his times, but he went to the University of Ed Edinburgh when he was 10, um, which seems really young, except for his, one, he was precocious, of course, not surprisingly, but two, his brother was going, and his brother was 12. And so it may simply have been a matter of family convenience. Well, we're sending one kid off, let's just send both of them off. And he returned from Edinburgh five years later at the age of 15 or 16, anyway, I think it was 15, right around then. Um, and, and, and in his autobiographical writings at the end of his life, he said, really, I didn't learn very much. He learned, you know, Latin, of course, polish up the Greek. That's a tough one. Uh, study languages, learn French <clears throat> on, along the way and <clears throat> read some of the classic sources in, in the process of learning the languages. But that was about it. He didn't feel like it had been a hugely gainful experience for him. So he was living at the time in sort of rural Scotland, and his family was not well-to-do, but they weren't poor. I mean, they were sort of well enough off that he didn't have to immediately get a job, and that's the crucial issue here. So they were sort of yeoman farmers that had had some uh, capital, So the, 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 and he was the second son, so he also didn't get as much money as his older brother, and this will be important later. And so they said, all right, well, why don't you study to pursue law and it turns out that Hume was interested in every subject except law. And so he sat in rural Scotland and sort of read by himself and just read everything. So in some ways, he's a classic autodidact. I mean, not completely, because he did have a, a fairly good foundation from the University of Edinburgh and local schools and such, but it was really his broad and, I don't know, we can't call it systematic, but dedicated reading over decade, about a decade, of just really dedicated, focused reading and research to try and think about the world. And that seems to be what he wanted to do. And uh, at some point he moves to France and he lives there for a while because it was cheaper than living in England. He had a small stipend that he could live off of, so he wanted to make that stretch as much as possible. 
throughout his life, he had a number of odd jobs. He worked for an ambassador, for, for English ambassador to Paris for a while, and he enjoyed that very much later in life. Was a toast of Paris, you know, intellectual circles. He, he tried to get some teaching jobs over in the course of his life at the University of Edinburgh, but um, people suspected that he might be an atheist because he might be an atheist. It's exactly what he believed in religion. It's hard to track down, but he certainly was not a upstanding member of any recognized religion of the time. Let's put it that way. Uh, so he, he was, they sus suspected him of certain heresy. And yeah, that was right. Absolutely true. So he did eventually become, I think, a librarian or like a, but mostly this was a, a, a sinecure. So he didn't have to do much and he could get a little more money um, and then continue his work. Um, eventually to try and make some money, he wrote a history of England, which turned out to be spectacularly successful and in fact gave him the uh, salary that he needed, the income that he needed for the rest of his life, so that he really did spend much of his life simply pursuing the studies that he was interested in, and much of those studies focused on uh, philosophy and fighting with the philosophers and the main intellectual traditions of his time. So that's just like a brief outline of his life. So what was he doing? Now, I started with the notion that he was an autodidact out there in sort of rural Scotland. And he was a sociable person, so it wasn't like he was a hermit. He wasn't Kant in that. Kant was actually moderately sociable when he was young, too, but became more hermit-like as he became older. Hume was, was sociable all his life. People liked him. He liked people. He had parties. He went out. You know, so it wasn't like he was this hermit, but he really did kind of closet himself on his own and spend hours and hours and hours research, reading, writing, taking notes, and creating ideas. And the core element, the thing that, you know, if nothing else is important and it grows out of this, is you go, okay, what are we talking about when we talk about philosophy? Basically, what are we talking about when we talk about anything, but philosophy is what he was focused on. And he says, well, and this is in the good empirical tradition, Bacon, Newton, Locke. He says, the only thing we really know are our sense impressions. And so what we need to start with when we think about anything is what is the content of our minds and how we process our sense impressions. So you can, you can kind of argue that he's kind of a first psychologist, cognitive scientist, because he spends lots and lots of time, and if you try to read his book on human understanding, you, you, you like way too much time, maybe trying to parse this out. Now, again, how successful he is, you, you know, you can argue with him in any paces, many many places, and and lots of scholars had. But what's important here is that he takes the empirical project that uh, you know Locke sort of articulates some of this, but he just runs with it, and he says, look, the only things we have access to are our sense impressions. And so it is our sense impressions and how we actually process them that matters when we talk about philosophy, when we talk about the world, when we try to understand what's going on with humans. And so he takes as the central and in fact only important element in philosophical inquiry is the working of the human mind to an extent, just an extraordinary extent. And he just comes back to this time and time again. He sort of weaves any kind of philosophical question you're going to ask, morals, as we'll see, existence of God, as we'll see, all of these kinds of issues. He just says, hey, let's bring it back to what, what sense impressions do we have? What actual experiences do we have? How does our mind process those experiences? And what can we derive from that? And it turns out not very much. Unfortunately, it becomes tricky, right? That's a, that's a huge limit on what we can think. Now, when he approaches this, he's in arguing with at least two main um, channels of thought at his time. One is he is arguing against the rationalists because the rationalists felt, and this is the Enlightenment rationalist tradition, reason and all this, the rationalists felt that we had a priori knowledge that could be arrived at and derived from human reason and logic, and that reason is the driving force uh, of mankind. The better, the better thing, the best thing that we have is our reason. We have a priori knowledge that our reason can shape to create universal principles and universal ideas. And this is the great power of man. Hume said, no, 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 no. You do not have that. 
you do not start with anything. You only start with your sense impressions. And so you can't have a priori knowledge. It just doesn't exist with you. And so only as you gather experiences and begin to think about them and process those experiences, do you develop ideas, which you then reflect on the world. And he develops this huge elaborate com set of complex relationships and talks about things that are mirrored and things that are, you know, sort of conjunctions of two ideas that produce new ideas. And he has all of this sort of language around this. That's not that crucial unless you really want to dig in there. But what is crucial is he says, look, there's no a priori knowledge, kind of going with Locke. And, there's, you, and you can't derive any of this from reason, which is sort of meh, in tension with Locke, right? But certainly a core argument with the rationalists. Similarly, you have the traditional religious or metaphysical positions, if you like, which say, no, no, man, you know, man has a soul, that soul comes from God, that we're informed with values that we're born with, which is not, we don't know them from reason. We know them because of God. They're given to us. They're God granted. They're just in us from birth. And, you know, this goes back. The Greeks had a lot of this and the Romans. And, you know, if you go back in philosophical tradition, of course, the Christ, uh, Christian tradition has this. And so you're just innately born with this awareness, this knowledge because of your soul, which is immortal. You know, uh, this is the uh, such Socratic idea of your soul uh, goes up, experiences the truth, comes down, is born into you. And so you have this sort of native instinct of truth. And so when you see truth, you resonate with it and you know, oh, that's the truth. And the more times you're reborn and your soul goes up and experiences truth in, in the perfect sense and comes back to earth, the higher up you are and the, the better you are able to recognize truth. For for Hume, this was all so much nonsense. He's like, no, this is just ridiculous. We're born, we know nothing, and it's only through our experiences that we begin to construct ideas, and those ideas inform us about the world, but mm, to a very limited degree because our experiences can be misleading and so on. So he's arguing against the rationalists and against uh, the religious sort of tradition, which is also the metaphysical tradition, more more grandly perceived. So basically, it's been the classical tradition as well as the Christian tradition. So it's a lot, right? He's really, <laughs> he's trying to throw off a whole bunch. And this is the power of the British empirical system and why empiricism is so important. And Hume is sort of the, again, he's sort of the end result of this. Another thing that I, and I've I talked about this earlier when I talked about the Enlightenment is one of the things that's also happening, you see this in Montaigne, you see this all over the place, and what really is informing Hume here is the sort of intellectual shockwave that went through Europe when you got the discovery of the New World. And what you found out is you had these huge civilizations, you had all these people, they never heard of Jesus, they had no religious background, they had different cultures, different ideas, and so... Europe was a Europe intellectuals, European intellectuals and thinkers were able to hold up a mirror to themselves and go, oh, hey, it, you know, sort of it ain't necessarily so it doesn't have to be this way. The world can be different. There's, you know, all this much greater variation than we sort of imagined out there in all of our systems. And so, wow, this caused a lot of reflection and, and intellectual angst and um, pause and for Montaigne, it was all very exciting and interesting. But for a lot of other thinkers who influenced and of whom Hume knew, they're like, oh, yeah, so we've got to start rethinking this. What really is base? What really is fundamental to the human when we see that there's all these other humans out here doing these cool things, but they're doing them very differently? And so a lot of the assumptions and just unarticulated assumptions were sort of exposed that then had to be addressed. And so this, you know, create a lot of the Enlightenment thinking was a response to these sorts of experiences, and Hume, uh, no exception. So what does this mean? So, so he rolls out, he says, all right, look, um, only thing we can know is what we experience. And so some, I mean, there's just so many examples here, but let's start with a couple of major ones that he has. So one is, he says, look, we have to stop with this ought thing. What we really want to do is get to the is of things. And so he said, if if you get lunch, let's say you order lunch, I'm a big fan of lunch, and you ordered a, a ham sandwich and you get a hamburger instead, waiter, waitress misunderstood what your order was or something, you don't you you think, oh, this ought to be a ham sandwich. 
What it is, is a hamburger. And he says, too often when we make these distinctions, we get, we confuse ourselves between the isness of things and the oughtness of things. And what we can, only thing we can experience directly in or through our sensations is the isness of things. And so we want to make sure when we are ex- talking about what. So if I get a hamburger and I say, oh, that is not a ham sandwich. I'm right. It isn't a ham sandwich. When I say it ought to be a ham sandwich, I'm saying this very strange thing. And, and, and trivial in this case, but it, it's it's what I'm saying is the universe is not conforming to my expectations of how it should be. Now, my expectation might be reasonable, right? I ordered one thing and I got another, but certainly it's not outside the realm of our experience that that happens. But you see, we predicate our notion of expectation because we construct this massive sort of intellectual fantasy about the oughtness of things. And, and we stop thinking about, oh, the isness. And so what, because of his empirical basis, he wants to consistently try and return us to how things are, not how we want them to be, not how they should be, not how they ought, hint the oughtness of things, but the isness of it. And he says in, in one of his arguments, his corpse, core arguments that really highlights this notion of we only have our sense impressions is if we can get down to what is in every philosophical question, this will be immensely helpful to us in trying to understand the content. So an example that I used a while ago from a, from a <clears throat> philosophical argument is they said, <clears throat> this philosopher said, oh, you know, if you see uh, a young child drowning in a in a pond as you're walking to work, even if you're wearing very expensive shoes, you'll almost certainly jump in the pond and rescue the child because you don't care about the cost of the shoes, right? And that it, this seems like an accurate case. You're saying, okay, this is probably what would happen. It's a probabilistic, you know, argument, but probably this this is right. And he says, okay. Why won't we then spend the same amount of money and send it someplace to save children that we can't see? And he says this is kind of a moral or intellectual failing. And this is the kind of thing that drove um, Hume absolutely mad because he's like, look, the isness of seeing a child, I can see that, I can feel that, that's very palpable. That I will respond to that because that's very human to me. This is this is a, a direct visceral connection. This is how humans are. This is what we do. To then say ipso facto, we ought to do this abstract action. He says it misses the point, right? It misses the isness of the world, and he said we do this. With self-baffling, he says, we baffle ourselves all the time because we continually mix what we, how we want the world to be, and we make all these judgments about it, rather than talking about what, how the world is. And this is, he says, just it drove him mad. And so, he, to get clarity, he always wanted to get back to what we could sense about the world as we were experiencing it. And he says, when you get big, grandiose metaphysical ideas, th- then you then you just lose track. So you go, for example, this is another example I've used before. I just think it's so useful, which is the argument over whether the tree in the Garden of Eden was an apple tree, or some say, well, it probably was an apple tree because the region at the time probably was a pomegranate tree. And that's a long-running debate. You can read all kinds of things. People argue this. And, and Hume is going to say, look, there was no Garden of Eden. So whether it ought to be an apple tree or a pomegranate tree, you've just self-baffled yourself with the isness, right? It, was there a Garden of Eden? Could we go there? Could we feel it? Could we experience it? If not, meh, now you're in the world of oughts. It ought to be this way uh, and so on. And so it's not, you know, he understands the power of imagination. He's very, you know, he understands, you know, conceptualizing all that, but he just says, when you're trying to think, 
when you're trying to get clarity on issues, one of the great places to start is with this question. And I will, I, I really find this hugely useful in my own life. I mean, rarely do I think of Hume as, you know, like a self-improvement guy. <laughs> That's not how his philosophy works. But this sort of clarity, I think, is really valuable to think about. Um, how often are we frustrated because the world is not how it ought to be. And, and I mentioned this before. Nietzsche, by the way, is influenced by this and really runs with this and says, look, you know, trying to get to the world as it is, is maybe our biggest single intellectual difficulty that we need to really try. We have to work hard to see it. And this is what Hume is saying. But, but when you're feeling confused or frustrated or something, I find it's very useful to stop and say, okay, am I being frustrated by an ought um, that And then where did that expectation come from? Is this an empirical expectation of a frustrated experience? Or is this just something where like, oh, I've just completely lost track of, you know, how things actually are through my own physical experience. And that kind of uh, clarity, which not doesn't work all the time, of course, not a perfect universal law, but it is hugely helpful, particularly, again, when you're talking about metaphysical debates. Um, one more example of this that maybe hopefully clarifies uh, a little bit. Um, one, I was talking to a person at a coffee shop who's taking a class right now, and she had to respond to a question that was, uh, what problems do does societies... Wait, wait, now I'm going to get this right. Uh, what are society, some of society's problems, and how can you um, address them? Okay. And I thought, wow, it's a horribly stupid question because a society is an abstraction. And so a society can't have problems, right? This is, this is one of those things. Individual people can have problems. You know, in fact, I would say individual people probably all do have problems. One of the great things about being human, you get some problems. Yay. Um, but can a society have a problem? Well, a society is an abstraction. So what we really mean when we say society has problems is society, as I conceptualize it, is not how I would like it to be. And so... I think there is a problem because society is wrong. Well, society can't be wrong. A society is just an is. The notion of it being having a problem is, of course, also wrong. I can have a problem. I can think there are problems in my community. I can experience those problems. I can even imagine that there's, I'm having problems with things in the world. I can imagine other people are having problems with things in the world. But the world doesn't have problems with things in the world because the world is just an abstraction. And so we constantly want to try and get our thinking from these sort of crazy abstractions that we can't really experience down to the concrete. So if you think about that problem and ask yourself, what are the problems that I experience in my life and how can I address those? This is a very much both easier to answer, more meaningful to answer question, as opposed to what are the problems society has and how can I address them, right? Is, which is... I, I don't know. Maybe society is happy and doesn't have any problems. Maybe society has a drinking problem, right? I, you know, what do you, ah, how do you define society? And it creates all these problems. So this is his, you know, try to debate is, which are those things you can experience very much concrete, very much um, pointable to within your empirical experience and sort of close intellectual uh, extrapolations from that versus the ought, how you want things to be, how you want them to desire to be. Closely allied to that is this notion of definitions, because he said we, we use language in very weird ways. And he says often we're not having actual debates, we're having debates based on the fact that we're being unclear in our language. I would say this is another great insight. However, you know, this is in the long tradition. Bacon made the same point. Uh, Locke definitely makes the same point. One reason Newton wants to use math, one reason science likes to use math is because they, they hope that it clarifies, right? That they, they try to, math is, is that language which tries to be absolutely as clear as possible. Um, and so what Hume suggested, of course, is if you have a term you want to look at it and say, okay, this is sort of, this is a very complex argument that he makes and lots of people have debated exactly what it means. So I'm going to boil this down roughly is he argues, hey, look, if we can take a look at a term and say, okay, can, 
I associate this with anything that's in my experience or close to my experience? If yes, great. If no, probably at some point this is just a meaningless term. Can I break it down into some other terms that I can then associate with an experience? So if I've never seen a camel, this makes it tough. But if if somebody says, hey, have you ever seen a camel? I say no. Okay, well, no use, of, but, but you know what a camel is like? A camel is like a horse. It's like this strange horse, or a horse is like a strange camel, depending on how you want to think about it. But they're about, mm, camels are a little bigger, four legs, it's got a hump. And I go, okay, you could describe that to me. And then if I went someplace where there were camels, I would almost certainly be able to go, boom, that's a camel because of the description I'd had that associated with a horse. So that means, hey, we're communicating. But if it's something like, oh, the grace of God, well, now we're just in trouble, right? What is grace? Oh, it's a spiritual element of your soul. Okay, what's the soul? Oh, it's the sense that comes from your God. Oh, what's the God? Well, it's this concept, right? And you just end up in these metaphysical circles. And he found it as a good way to sort of try and stab at all these bizarre metaphysical arguments that never boil back down to anything that we experience in our actual lives. There's no empirical basis of this. And so the ideas are just fantastical uh, ideas that are driven out of our, derived out of our minds and really have no strong correlation with the world and therefore aren't that useful. And so again, related to the is ought is this notion of, hey, can we take a definition of, of key terms and get it down to something that can be based on our empirical experience. And then when for communication, the idea of shared empirical experience, and that's like, whoa, yes, that's great. Now, now we're talking, now we're, now we're making some headway. Uh, one of my friends always says, if someone's never had chocolate, you can't describe how chocolate tastes to them. I think it's a great example. It'd be really hard to say, oh, how does chocolate taste, right? They're not gonna really get it. But if you've both had chocolate, even if you don't have the word chocolate, you can, you can point to the thing chocolate and go, oh, yes, yeah, we can nod now and we can communicate about chocolate because we've had this shared experience and we kind of have this overlap of empirical knowledge. And so this is kind of what Hume's always trying to uh, get us back to. Um, so if the only thing is empirical, what do you do with morals, right? How do you have an empirical sense of morals? Okay, very big problem. Of course, the rationalists are going to say, yeah, you're given a priori, you can reason out morals with your mind, rational mind, a priori ideas, you can derive some big general morals. Of course, they're going to debate about what those morals are, which suggests that it's not that great. But um, there you go. Of course, the metaphysical tradition is going to give you all the, you know, God, you can derive it from God, and so on. Um, Hume enters this from what was called the... Uh, sentimental position. That's it. That's the word. The technical term, I believe, was sentimentalists. He was not really a great sentimentalist on lots of fronts because it's another school of philosophy at the time. But he did sort of agree with him on this. And he's like, our morals have to be derived from our experience. Of course, you will not be surprised by this standpoint. And so what is it in our experience that allows us to derive morals? And he argues, hey, we can feel with people that our morals are derived from our capacity to see somebody and to actually sort of feel what they're feeling. Now, could we feel their pain? Could we feel their pleasure? Could we feel their sorrow? Could we feel their fear? Could, it's not a bad feeling, right? It's not like suffering or it could be suffering, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily that. But if you stop and think about this, you go, oh yes, um, this is what, you know, we can do this, right? When, if you see someone playing like football um, and you see them get hit, like, oh, you feel a little pain, right? You feel your muscles tense and you get that sort of, uh, that, that uh, the capacity to feel literally with people. It's an interesting human capacity. And so first thing to note is Hume is correct. We do have this capacity, right? So this is why he's often considered the father of cognitive science is because he's sitting there and going, well, what actually happens? You know, how do we feel sometimes when we see other people? What is or Oh, sometimes we imagine they're feeling, but then sometimes we actually feel some version of what they're feeling, it's just, which is interesting, which is, it's, an, it's a human capacity. Um, and, and, and that allows us to sort of have the sense of, I don't know, sort of community with them. He, called, he talks about family and extended family and how we think about this. 
but that's the root of it. It comes from this actual experience. And then from that experience of the shared sense of, of uh, feeling, then we can start building up things that, oh, we don't want this to happen to us or to them. And we do want this to happen to us and or to them because that makes me feel good. That makes me feel bad. This is, this is uh, uh, depressing. This is exciting. This is interesting. All, all of that panoply of emotions that collect on there. Now we can build some sense of a moral system from that. But notice this is not going to be founded on absolute reason because it's coming from our emotion. It's not going to be founded on some sort of laws of God or anything like this. So it's going to be this kind of crazy amorphous exploration of what it means to be human, how we emotionally relate to each other, what's, what's our internal psychology, how do we process this, what do you do about the people that don't mind when other people suffer, you know, and he talks all about this. He's not a fool. He goes through a lot of, I mean, boy, at length, when you read some Hume, you find out he goes through everything at ridiculous length, but you're like, oh yeah, he's thinking about this. Again, I don't always agree with it. He sort of glosses over some of the complications and you go, what about these exceptions? I mean, you can argue with Hume as you go along, which I don't think he would mind at all, but you go, wow, he's really trying this out. And as one of the earliest thinkers to seriously try to explore how we actually think, what's going on in our minds as we think, how do we feel? Um, you know, this is this is what you would expect from an explorer. It's not perfect. It's not totally polished. There's all weird sides and so on. But um, powerful exploration of this sense of man sort of is the measure of all things. Um, part of this, uh, again, not surprisingly, he says, look, what comes first? If our sensations come first then it's not reason, right? If it's, if it's our experience with the world, it's not reason that's driving us, it's our emotions. And he says, and, and so Hume chips a lot of, of course, the rationalists and, and other sort of conceptual philosophical ideas on its head. And he says, no, no, we're emotional beings. We're driven by our emotions and our psychology more, more broadly. And then we use our reason to facilitate that. So if our emotions say, oh, I want, um, I'm hungry, then we turn on the reason machine that says, okay, how do I get some food? What should I eat? You know, these kinds of, I'm lonely. Okay, now can, let me think about how I can get a partner. Now think about whether I should get a partner. Or not. You know, that would be sort of, that's the moral judgment part. But he says reason is sort of a facilitator of our emotions. And that really drove people mad because then they're going, hey, no, then we're just this collection of emotions and we're, you know, we're not these higher beings driven by our God-given intellect to create and, uh, you know, admire and sort of be these perfect or, or potentially perfect beings who glow with light. Hume was like, yeah, I just don't think that's how we are. I think we're just very much more emotionally, corporally, physically, mentally driven by all these collection of panoply of drives and complications and um, desires and ideas that flit around in our, you know, physical, real, empirically testable bodies. And again, in the history of philosophy, this is not the most popular of positions. Epicurus gets somewhere along this lines in places. So you can look, it's not that he's completely without precedent, but he just he really goes the full distance on this. And again, I think part of it is because he spent so much time sitting with himself. What was the subject that he had available for him to study that he wanted to study? It was him. And so he just spent a lot of time going, wow, how do I really think? How do I really feel? What do I really experience moment to moment? Um, am I being driven by my logic? No, I wake up in the morning and I think something and I go, oh, where did that thought come from? Not from my reason. Um, and then how do I pursue it? And, and he really focuses on that consistently in all of his works. So again, part of what, what drives him is this notion of, hey, if it's our experiences that are first, what do our experiences excite? It didn't did excite logic most of the time. They excite, you know, memory and emotion and desires and all of the human animal aspect of us. That's the first thing that gets triggered. And then what follows is going to be highly variable depending on what the empirical input is. 
And even a lot of the other empiricists were not all that excited by Hume's, you know, sort of taking empiricism to this, this radical extension because, again, they wanted uh, reason to dominate. One of, one of the classic examples of this is people say, oh, you know, science is this logical, uh, factual, reasoned discipline. And in a way it is. But the why do people pursue science is absolutely 100% not in any way. So people pursue science for fame and for promotion and for recognition and because they want to be in the history books or they want to not have to deal with their colleagues or because they don't know what else to do, right? I mean, there's any number of reasons people spend their t lives doing science and, you know, rational nobility of enlightened beings floating in platonic, you know, spheres of perfect bliss is, is not them. It's not that. Right, that whatever it is, it's not that. So what you have is you have imperfect humans with all their base drivers and motives utilizing science to achieve goals, which might be admirable and great and wonderful. Thank you very much for the, all the achievements, but they're, they're not rational, right? They're not reasonable uh, in any context. In fact, in some cases, science may be the most unreasonable thing we do because what a crazy, crazy undertaking, not anti-scientific in any way, but to just recognize this is the distinction that Hume's trying to make. Abstract science is, well, science is an abstraction. So like, okay, we can talk about a little bit, but the people who are doing science that we can talk about, we've had experience with them. We know them, we can meet them, we can read their biographies and goes, yeah, I can tell you how they are. I can tell you their isness and they're not being draw driven by logic often. Uh, that's not what's keeping them going. <clears throat> so that, again, comes right back down to that fundamental notion of experience and, and deriving from there. And of course, uh, as one can imagine, this is going to lead him to a curious, at best, notion of religion. And so his great dialogue on religion, uh, which he casts in the mode of a classic dialogue between three, three, yeah, three people, three speakers, yeah. um, was so controversial that his friend said, you know, you might want to hold off and not publish that until after you're dead. Just saying, right? Because you're, you're, you, you're, people suspect you of being an atheist as it is, and this is not going to help your cause in any way. Now, whether he was actually an atheist is not clear. In fact, it takes a while to actually get the idea of someone who totally disbelieves in all that the, that I think the word atheist is not used in, for like another hundred years, maybe. Of the, I can't forget. It's the, the word actually, no God, atheist, um, is not used until shockingly late in the English language. And I think it had to do with the Darwin debates, but I, I forget exactly, but someone can look that up. But So the notion that he would be truly athe an atheist is unlikely. But um, again, he certainly wasn't a standard, he wasn't an upright member of the Anglican Church or of the Scottish um, Enlightenment in that sense. But so what he says, you know, sort of basically with God is they have this long debate and they go, they just butcher all of the arguments for God through this thing. I mean, it's really, he's good at this kind of thing. He's a good writer. Um, and he finally ends up with this notion, again, not surprisingly for Hume, is he just goes, look, when you reflect on it what god is simply this extension of the functioning of our own minds like we imagine ourselves and then we imagine ourselves sort of extended to the scope of the universe and then we know that we have ideas and so let's imagine we have all the ideas we know we have knowledge let's imagine we know all the facts we know we're mortal so let's let's not let's imagine that we're immortal and we last forever okay great We'll just call that bunch of characteristics God. And he said that basically this is all we're doing. We're not, there's no reason to suspect any of this is true. We can't experience infinite knowledge or infinite space or immortality because we're finite, limited, mortal beings. So that's all just so much fluff. So we're just really, again, this is back to his, you know, definitional idea. Is there any experience of any of this? No, it's just metaphysical nonsense, right? We, even if God existed, who had all of these characteristics is another way to phrase this. Um, we still wouldn't, we still would have no concept of God because 
to have a concept of God, you would have to have some experience of all that stuff, and we have no experience of it. It's impossible for us to have an experience of being immortal. It's impossible of us to have an experience of being all knowledgeable. It's impossible of us to have a, a, a sense of being out of time, right? Being infinite, being before the universe. And so all those abstract ideas, you can't break them down into anything that we can actually have an experience of. And so either there is no God, or there is a God exactly as we imagine God to be, but it doesn't matter because we still don't know anything about him because all of this language doesn't mean anything to us. It has no content. And so that is a very uh, damning thing because it, it's not arguing just that there is no God, which people have argued off and on in different very ways, or that God is this very strange kind of being. He just says, look, if there, even if there was a God, we couldn't say anything about him or know anything about him or have any interaction with him or it or them because they would be completely outside of human conception. We just, you know, it's like, what, you know, what does um, the planet Saturn taste like? You know, I don't know, <laughs> right? I can imagine it, but I'm not really imagining it. I can say it, but I don't have, I don't have any content for that. And that was his struggle. In some ways, he, he would, in theory, be more sympathetic to the Greek gods because the Greek gods were just big, you know, sort of hopeless humans. And he go, oh, okay, like, right. How did the Greeks imagine their gods? Just exactly like them, basically, but they didn't seem to die so much. But otherwise, like, okay, at least that's a sort of semi-comprehensible god. He could have a little sympathy in that direction because, oh, you know, you have a, a, a mighty warrior god. He's just really, really a good warrior. You have, uh, you know, a wise God. She's just super wise, but she's not infinitely wise, not a perfect warrior. But once you get to that stretch, now you're just completely out of the human conception and therefore um, very much pointless. And so for Hume, um, and of course, at his time when he was alive, making those arguments put you very well and truly outside the pale. And many Enlightenment thinkers were not that impressed with him. Many were. But everyone recognized, like, wow, he's raising a lot of troublesome positions. Is there anything we can know that comes not through, primarily through our senses? And so this, basically, hello, Kant, right? Like, now, this is where Kant's going to come in. Kant's going to say, no, 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 he's not right about that. Um, and so you know, Kant makes lots of counter arguments to Hume, but it's Hume that gets his wheels moving. Uh, a lot of other thinkers the same way have picked up threads of his and gone, oh, okay, this was an interesting idea, but let's push it in a different direction. But for the empirical pro process and for the development of British philosophy, he just represents this kind of blowing open this massive field and sort of is the, I don't know, not the end of, but he really kind of bounds out empiricism. People have studied it since then, and it's expanded, and it's still a going concern, of course, but it's hard to see how anybody's done a lot more than Hume. So at the end of his life, um, again, he went to Paris. He was sort of the toast of Paris. This also helped to spread his ideas because the thinkers there met him. They're like, wow, this guy's amazing. So the ones that hadn't already heard of him started reading his philosophy. So he was one of the uh, British thinkers who was more influential on the continent than many other British thinkers were who were who were more isolated and not that interested in, you know, interacting directly. He spoke very excellent French, got along with them very well, was interested in communicating with them, didn't spend a lot of time in the sort of uh, wars of intellectual wars. You know, he wasn't that person. He didn't want to fight with people. He was very much more interested in just conversation and sharing ideas and being entertaining and enjoying himself. And so he was very influential both personally, but then that also helped to communicate his ideas. Uh, and his history, by the way, should, it is, it, it's worth mentioning that his history is, it was a huge hit. It was a really, really big hit, but it's a very, it's kind of a, a tendentious history. So he did check some sources. It's not that it's, you know, hugely inaccurate. It's just sort of a bit one-sided. He knew he knew which side of history he was on, and he, you know, kind of consciously presented that side and, you know, made the people he didn't like look bad and the people he did like look good. 
um, using the evidence that was available to hand, which is part of the reason that it was popular. It was sort of in that tradition of, um, you know, sort of heavily history that leans in a direction that people might like. And so it had a political core to it that made it more popular than just a dry uh, historical run might be. And so in basically, and so that's just touching the surface of some of the major elements, but when you think about, you know, the foundations of science, uh, the cognitive uh, science, if you want to think about it that way, you know, moral philosophy, religious philosophy, and the concept of does God exist, how logic works, the, the interaction between mor morals and, uh, I mean, emotions and logic, and hence, of course, on anything to do with logical argumentation, causality. He had some really great things to say about causality. Basically, he said causality is always simply a, a supposition that we've seen things work a lot you know, again, the is and the ought. And so we think, oh, this is likely to happen, but that doesn't mean any of these things have caused anything to happen. He's, he's again, lots of debates about what he means by causality, but he, he throws a lot of sand into the gears of what people thought, oh, causality, we understand this. A causes B, B causes C. Hume comes along and just throws sand in that. I don't know, again, I don't know if he concludes anything. I don't know if he comes up with any, you know, firm, definite, like, okay, this is absolutely how it is, and people are convinced by that, but it he did make trying to explain causality. Once you've read Hume, causality just becomes, this, again, another swamp. He made swamps, and then people are in there trying to clean that up and go, okay, yeah, our, our earlier notions of causality, not that systematic and not as simple as we thought it was. Yeah, so he he really made things more complex and difficult to deal with in a lot of fields. And he talked about art. He talked about literature. He was a good writer. He was known as a good writer in his time. Um, and so, yeah, influential across a number of fields, still influential today because of that. And finally, to, to, to leave off, I would like to say, if you're going to read Hume um, on human understanding, I would say that's the place to start and maybe the place to end, depending on what you're interested in. Unless you have a very specific field you're interested in, then you can go through and look at his works and pick out that from them. Um, but, but be wary here. This is just a warning sign. Like some philosophers need warning. Like Kant that needs the big flashing lights. His style, he was considered a great stylist at his time, and you can, I think he is a good stylist. I think he's enjoyable to read once you get used to that style. We're just not used to it anymore. <clears throat> but he is trying to take apart, like, the way the human mind works without any of the apparatus of modern cognitive science or psychology. <clears throat> and so... A lot of time you're like, what exactly is he trying to say? And it's clear that he doesn't have the language that we've developed over the last, you know, couple hundred years of, of, of science, cognitive science and psychological research, sociological research, by the way, because a lot of what he's doing is sociology because he keeps looking at humans and humans in groups very, very concretely. And so it can be a bit baffling at times, but I would say don't worry too much about making sure you're tracking every single argument he makes and getting everything right. Just see if you can keep track of the problems and questions he throws up. In some ways, that's really what Hume is about. He's throwing up problems. He's making things that seem simple, uh, more complicated, more challenging. He's showing our, our biases that we get from our culture and from our continual ability to, to imagine how the world ought to be rather than how it is. And our use of language to refer to things that are fantastical and don't, doesn't clarify as opposed to trying to focus on what we can experience and share and agree on and therefore actually make some progress. And if you can do that while you read him, I think it becomes clear very quickly like, wow, this guy was really breaking a lot of ground, making a lot of headway and opening up a lot of space for us to think and reflect and have uh, new ideas about the world. Whether or not we agree with him, I think he'll get you reflecting going, oh, wow, I didn't think about that, didn't think about it that way. Oh, now I've got, I've got to kind of respond and, you know, come up with a, um, you know, a new way of thinking. I was being quite naive and overly simplistic in my approach. And I may not think that Hume's got it right. A lot of times it's pretty clear Hume isn't necessarily think he's got it definitely right. But he is thinking about it and he is opening up these passages. And the closest analogy I can think of Hume is he's sort of a more philosophically bent Montaigne. You know, he really is just sort of reflecting and developing his ideas as he's writing. You can kind of feel that.
uh, in the way he writes. And he definitely was careful in his structure, so it's not that he's ha- haphazard in the way that Montaigne is, but they are both have that sense of exploration and development, and you feel like you're right there with them as new ground, new ideas, new things are, are being developed. So Hume, thank you very much.